Welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast and the official podcast of the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. Our guest today is well known to our audience because he has been on the show frequently, Dr. William Mart of Stanford University, who is also the editor of the Sacred Music Journal and president of the Church Music Association of America. We discuss the liturgical and musical practices surrounding the tradition of the Lady Mass or the Marian Votive Mass, with a special emphasis on this practice at Salisbury Cathedral in England. Before we get into the episode, I'd like to invite you to visit the website of the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music, catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org. We have a lot of things going on this spring semester and into the summer, including an upcoming concert of the Baroque masterpieces of Marian devotion, the Pergolesi Stabat Mater and the Bach Magnificat, featuring some of our students. And starting in April, there is a three-part workshop series on Monday evenings on an introduction to Gregorian chant. It's a great place to start for you or your singers who are looking to understand more not only about how to sing and read the chant, but also to understand it liturgically and theologically. Of course, there's also our summer 2024 term of free tuition graduate level classes in sacred music, among quite a few other events. We encourage you to sign up for our email list to stay up to date on happenings at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. And you can sign up for that list in a pop-up on our website, which is again, catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org. And now on to our episode. Bill, you're a frequent flyer on our show. So welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> so this summer at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music, you're going to be teaching a class on the propers of the mass. And I wanted to go into some of that material um, in an introductory sort of way by focusing on um, Marian masses. So I would like to start off this topic by just asking you if you could explain what a lady mass is. Yes, uh, the lady mass was uh, was a phenomenon in the medieval uh, church, particularly in the cathedrals, and it was there was. Uh, architecturally, there was a lady chapel, that is a separate chapel for the Lady Mass to be celebrated. And the the whole history of it architecturally is quite interesting, and the and the, the variabilities of the lady lady chapels are interesting. But it was a a, a Marian mass that was celebrated uh, at, I'm particularly thinking of Salisbury Cathedral, which is the one I know best. It was celebrated every day except for Good Friday and Holy Saturday. In fact, so extensively was it celebrated that only those two days was it not. So it is a a, a Marian Mass. Uh, You might call it a votive Mass uh, because uh, some of the texts are texts that we recognize as being used for, uh, for, for Marian votive Masses. Can I interrupt, Bill, and and just insert the question? Um, could you explain um, uh, the word votive in terms of masses? Yes, uh, votive has to do with uh, with uh, ultimately with a um, kind of a petition for for a favor from God, and uh, so a votive mass is a mass that is dedicated to a particular cause or a particular saint or a particular purpose, independent of the calendar, independent of the liturgy that is is ordered on the calendar. So you can have a, Mar- a Marian votive mass lots of days of the year, and uh, the uh, the Marian votive masses are, are set out so that there are four different kinds of texts depending on the season, but otherwise it's fairly open as to, as to when it can be, can be said. In some cases, uh, in in the modern church, there are limitations as to when you can do a votive mass. You can't do it on major feast days, for instance. Right. At Salisbury, the votive Lady Mass was celebrated absolutely every day of the year, except for the days on which there was no mass celebrated, i.e., 
Good Friday and Holy Saturday. Right. So can you talk a little bit about um, that particular practice in um, that the Lady Chapel, for example, at Salisbury? Who came to that Mass? Who celebrated it? Well, that's it's an interesting question, who came to it. Uh, the question of who celebrated it is is also quite quite interesting. The rubrics for the celebration of Mass at Salisbury Cathedral provide that there are three Masses celebrated. There is the conventional Mass, which is the canons of the cathedral in the principal choir of the cathedral, the, the choir stalls sitting before the sanctuary and the altar. But there's the morning Mass, which is earlier in the morning, and it uses whatever Mass proper happens to concur at the same time as the principal Mass. So on a principal day, for instance, Pentecost, if Pentecost happens to fall on a calendar day that has a saint's day, then they would celebrate the saint's day mass at the morning mass. Otherwise, the morning mass is a votive mass. But then there's the chapter mass in the choir, and then the rubric says the canons celebrate the chapter mass, and the assumption is that they're singing chant. And then three clerics are delegated to sing the Lady Mass in the Lady Chapel. And I have always thought that meant one of them was the priest for the Mass and two of them were the singers. False. Uh, <laughs> the, the three clerics are priest, deacon, and subdeacon. It's a solemn Mass with all the trimmings. Go big or go home. That's right. <laughs> so the from from the uh, from the uh, the documentation that has been produced uh, the, there is this this recent publication of the uh, the lady mass at Salisbury Cathedral a two volume publication which is filled with historical data and uh, lots of really interesting material and it's clear they they set out clearly what what the personnel of this mass is and it is that you have the the three celebrants priest, deacon, and subdeacon. You have an acolyte, a thurifer, and two candle bearers, and you have 13 singers. So it's it's a big deal. And I think it's something that we don't understand quite because it is, it's not principally for a congregation. It's principally for God. It's a, it is the service of the cathedral chapter in many cases. Salisbury was aware of the needs of the people. And so you had at Salisbury Cathedral a number of different kinds of masses going on. You had chantry masses. That is to say, um, a person with some means could establish an endowment for, for a priest who would celebrate a requiem mass for this person every day in a separate little chantry chapel, a, a little side chapel usually very small, uh, just for a room of a priest and a, an acolyte uh, and a little altar, and they would celebrate a Mass every day. So the, uh, the issue is then, what's going on during, a, dur during the day uh, in, in these, these, these various chapels? And the rubrics for Salisbury Cathedral are quite interesting because they say the scheduling of these chantry masses should be should be done in such a fashion that that there is always one going on. They shouldn't be all at the same time, but they should be scheduled throughout the morning, so that if a layperson comes into the into the cathedral and wants to attend a mass, there will be one there for him to attend. Wow! <laughs> yeah, isn't that nice? Yeah. Likewise, it's understood that there will be some laity attending the Lady Mass. And uh, it's that varies considerably from place to place, but at some places there is, there is quite specific mention of accommodating the laity. And what time would this have, have been at, at, at Salisbury? Well, it would have been after the conventional Mass. The conventional Mass would have been mid-morning, 10 o'clock or maybe a little later. So then the Lady Mass would take place after that, it's got to have pressed the time for lunch a little bit late, maybe, but um, so it would would have been after the after the conventional mass. 
Yeah. So maybe it was something that, you know, people working could do on their, on their, um, you know, when they were taking time for lunch. It's a possibility, although it's not clear just how long it would take for it to be sung because the, 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 the music is relatively extensive. There's no, there's no homily. So that, that means that it's not quite as long as we, we might expect. But, uh, even so, and there is, there is at Salisbury a concern for accommodating the laity. For instance, on Palm Sunday, they bless the palms, and then the members of the choir are incensed separately, each member at once. And it says the members of all of the choir are incensed, and then whatever laity happen to be standing in the sanctuary. Oh, wow. (laughs) So it's probably not very different from how it is today, where... You have even song and the choir is there and then lots of laity come and sit in the choir stalls. So the Lady Mass then, it is a votive Mass. Uh, It is a solemn high Mass every day with plenty of ceremonies. The color of the vestments is always white, even in the density of Lent. It's it's interesting that that, 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 that that would be a difference, but there it is. The music for the Lady Mass is music that we that we see in the in the in the votive masses for the blessed virgin but it's more extensive so there is a different set of chants for every day of the week so the mass ordinary there are seven different mass ordinaries that are used yeah actually you know before we before we dive into all um, the particulars of the the text and the chants can i ask you a few more questions just about the structural aspect of the lady mass what you're describing at salisbury um was this something common to other cathedrals or you know was it something particularly well developed at salisbury and relatedly um it sounds from the schedule that you're describing that because it's such a huge use of personnel that if it were to happen somehow in a parish it would have have to had had to have been scaled back somehow and that perhaps is probably also not conducive to being uh, taking place in a monastery but that really this is maybe like a primarily a cathedral thing and maybe secondarily a, a parish thing well interestingly the history uh, that is that is uh, charted in this new publication by John Harper is that it began in the Benedictine houses and so they, the monasteries would have had a, a Lady Mass earlier than the cathedrals. But all of the English cathedrals have Lady Chapels. And I think that the, I think the Lady Mass, I, I don't know about the schedule, whether it was every day of the week or not, uh, but the Lady Mass was certainly quite common to the medieval cathedrals. And the, the fact that these, these Lady Chapels are fairly sizable and fairly beautiful and in prominent places in the church means that it was it had a, a very significant role in the in the liturgy. For instance, at Salisbury Cathedral, the Lady Chapel is due east of the high altar. So it's it's on the axis of the cathedral and at the at the crux of the ge- geography of the cathedral, that is to say the easternmost part of the church. In monastic churches, generally speaking, the the choir area, the altar and the choir stalls and so forth, were part of of the enclosure, and so were not open to laity. So, for instance, at uh, at Durham Cathedral, there is a a big black line at the very back of the church, and that is the point beyond which uh, which people couldn't go. But on the other hand, for monastic churches. Very often, the Lady Chapel was on the side or at the back, so the laity could come to the Lady Mass, even at a monastic cathedral. And you realize that maybe half the cathedrals in in England were monastic, that is to say, the cathedral chapter was actually a monastery of monks, and the bishop was abbot of the monastery. So can we wrap it around to parishes? Would you have seen this sort of schedule in a parish? I doubt it. I have been in lots of old parish churches and not a single one of them have I seen a lady chapel. So I th- I think that the uh, it may well be that on occasion a lady mass was celebrated as 
as can be the case even today, a votive mass of the blessed can be celebrated at at will in some ways, uh, depending on the calendar. I, I have my doubts that there was a regularly scheduled Lady Mass in the parishes. Right. So speaking of, of parish practice of, of Lady Masses, um, certainly we can think about in our time the popularity of the Rorate Mass. How does that fit into this whole tradition? Well, that seems to have been a Mass before Christmas. The the Mass propers are the Lady Mass for uh, the season of Advent, which in turn are the texts of the Mass propers for the fourth Sunday of Advent. So it, it suggests that the development of votive Mass texts was something that, that they were generally speaking, or most often at least, drawn from the, the Masses of feast days. Can you talk a little bit about those particular propers for the Rorate Mass, the Advent Marian votive Mass? Well, yes, they are quite proper to uh, to the season of Advent. And so, for instance, the introit, Rorate Chaley, drop down dew from heaven above. This is, this is uh, of course, anticipating the birth of Christ and seeing the descent of dew as a symbol of the descent of Christ onto earth. And then the bearing forth of the fruit of the earth right. as the coming forth from the womb of Our That's Lady. Right. Let of the our clouds Lord. rain the just. Let the earth be opened and bud forth a Savior. So yeah. it's quite explicit uh, of a, a nice parallel there. And the, uh, the psalm verse the heavens uh, show forth the glory of God, and the firmament declares the work of his hands. So uh, that follows upon the same notion. Uh, the Advent ones are perhaps more distinct from the others, uh, the other votive masses. So, for instance, the introit for most votive masses of the Blessed Virgin is Salve Sancta Parens. And that is an interesting text because it is attributed to Sedulius, a fifth century poet. And you think, wait a minute, how can a chant have come all the way from the fifth century? <laughs> and the answer is it didn't. <laughs> they took Sedulius's poetry, which was that that poem, Salve Sancta Parens, was very popular and was widely widely read and uh, and recited. But they took the uh, introit text, the introit melody from Epiphany. So it's the same, the same melody that has been adapted, and uh, one can see this kind of adaptation taking place very often. The basic repertory of Gregorian chants that was historic, uh, that was ancient, is very often paraphrased or made a, into a contrafactum, uh, a giving a new text to an old melody. So that's you find that often. Although there is also the process of writing new chants when you need it. Yeah, could you speak about the the um, text from a different season other than Advent? Yes, so uh, so the um, the Feast of the Purification to Advent, that is to say, the principal part of the year. You see, that's three quarters at least of the of the whole year. This is the the one, and that has that that Sedulius right? and um, with a Psalm verse, Eructavi cormeum verbum bonum. My heart has uttered uttered. A good word, and that psalm is the is the psalm for the day. Not just for my heart has uttered a good word, but rather for the next verses of the, of the psalm, which would read, "My heart has overflows with a goodly theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe." Then you are the fairest of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your, your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, and your glory and majesty. The obvious point of address is this is to Christ. But with the Psalms, you have always a multiplicity 
of layers of meaning. And whereas very often in a psalm, the text can refer principally to Christ, it can also be made to refer to the Blessed Virgin. I think of the Song of Songs, for instance, as a, as a good example of that. Originally, people have said it was the, the love of God for his people. And then after that, it was said, the love of his people for God. And after that, it was said, uh, the love of God for the Blessed Virgin. And after that, it was said, the love of the people for the Blessed Virgin. And all of those layers of meaning have been legitimate in the use in the liturgy. I think it's an interesting thing about the, the use of Scripture in the liturgy, but that the multiplicity of meanings can be drawn out for a specific day. So on a specific day, on a votive Mass of the Blessed Virgin, you can then use that same, you are the fairest of the sons of men, grace is poured upon your lips, you can apply it to, uh, to the Blessed Virgin. So that's the that's the psalm verse uh, for the introits of that day, and it's the psalm verse for for some other other chants during the day as well. Some others of the texts are not scripture; they are simply Marian texts. So the gradual on this most Marian masses of the of the year uh, says, "Blessed and venerable art thou, O Virgin Mary, who." with unsullied vir- vir- virginity, was found to be the mother of the Savior. Or the Alleluia. After childbirth, thou didst still remain an inviolate virgin. Mother of God, intercede for us. Right, and these are clearly poetic uh, texts, not directly drawn from Scripture, but obviously informed by Scripture. That's right, that's right. The offertory is a, a very widely spread chant in the Middle Ages, and it's one that hasn't found its way into the into the modern liturgy so much. It is found in these votive masses, and it is Felix Namque, For thou art happy, O sacred Virgin Mary, and most worthy of all praise, since out of thee hath risen the Son of Justice, Christ our God. It's so wonderful. You know, could we wrap back um, now to, you mentioned seven different Mass ordinaries in the Salisbury uh, collection for the Lady Mass. What what did that look like, and what are those melodies experienced as now? Many of those are melodies that we recognize in the uh, in the, uh, the Curiale Romanum. Uh, so uh, the Mass 9 is the one that normally carried the the tropes. That is to say, there are extra added texts to the Gloria text. And it's, I think it's worth looking at those just a minute because they're quite beautiful. In some cases, the, the tropes added, added to texts were, you might say, excessive. But this, but this one is, is really quite, quite simple and quite beautiful. First of all, the Gloria is a text that belongs to Christmas. And as such, its principal impulse is the relationship of the son to the father, and this is also then the characteristic of the, the mass proper for the for the midnight mass of Christmas. It's all the relation of the son to the father, and so the Gloria really is just about the father and the son until the doxology at the end of the mass, which refers to the Holy Spirit. There were those, however, who wanted the Gloria to be Trinitarian. And so, in different places, they inserted the Holy Spirit at a certain point. So here, after you have Domine Deus Rex Celestis, Deus Pater Omnipotens, Domine Fili Unigeniti Jesu Christe, so the Father and the Son, then Spiritus et Alme Orphanorum Paraclite, the Spirit and Loving Protector of Orphans. That's the Holy Spirit. Then comes Domine Deus Agnus Dei Filius Patris, the Son of the Father, Primogenitus Maria Virginis Matris, the firstborn of Mary, the mother, the Virgin Mother. Then Quitolus Peccata Mundi, Misveri Nobis, Quitolus Peccata Mundi, Susipe Depuratium Nospum, and then Ad Maria Gloriam, Quisedis Ad Dexterum Patris, Misveri Nobis, Quoniam Tu Solus Sanctus, Mariam Sanctificans, for you alone are holy, sanctifying Mary. 
Tu solus dominus, you are Lord, Mariam gubernans, governing Mary. Tu solus altissimus, Mariam coronans, you are most high, crowning Mary. And that's the that's the end of the, the Marian tropes to the Gloria. But you see the um the, the impulse of it all is to is to relate Mary to Christ and to in fact give a liturgical correlative to something that you see very often in the timpani of the cathedrals, that is to say the the principal sculptural uh, depiction above the uh, above the main portals of the cathedral uh, is very often uh, the coronation of Mary, Mary bending down and Christ placing a crown upon her head, so that that sculptural and artistic depiction then receives a liturgical expression as well. You know, it, it's interesting to think about the origins of these texts and the relationship to the act of theology within the life of the church. You know, of of course, we think of the 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 dictum uh, lex orandi statuit lex credendi. Yes. Um, but there seems to be in this uh, practice of troping a sort of dialogue with with theology and reflection upon one's knees as a way of doing theology. Would would these texts used as tropes have originated from a musical uh, person, a musical theologian of sorts, or do you think they found their way through um, a cathedral or a monastic? house tradition and reflection into the liturgy the the role of tropes in general is quite old so that already in the carolingian era you have tropes to the introit and the tropes to the introit are always you have you have the the established introit you have then a phrase that comes before the first phrase of the introit that has the function of attracting the attention to the introit, of attracting the devotion to the introit. And so the whole troping of the introit means a trope, then the first line of the text, and then another trope, and then the second line, and then another trope and the third line, etc. So the, the, that troping, and they are, they are very different texts from the introit itself. They actually call for a sense of devotion to the liturgy sometimes to the text itself, but also just to the act of introit in the liturgy itself. Yeah, and I mean, the common experience of this now in the the new rite of the Mass is obviously the penitential act version C, you were sent to heal the contrite of heart, Lord have mercy, etc. And I, I think people can get that sense of it, but it was, it was something very extensive and... Oh, yes. Not, not, not a... a devotional in terms of how we think maybe of devotions as extra liturgical things to do to provide fertile ground for one's piety, but but intimately involved with the act of, of theological speculation, theological thinking. The, the liturgy must be the, the stimulus for devotion. To follow the liturgy uh, means to cultivate a sense of devotion ultimately a sense of identification with Christ's act of sacrifice to the Father. So um, if, if we could wrap up just a, a part of this uh, discussion on, on the, the ordinaries. So you're, you're talking about the, the relationship to Mass 9, but do we see any of these other seven Salisbury um, uh, um, ordinaries in our, our modern Kyrielli? Most of them, yes. So principally, yes. Uh, so I, I I haven't checked them all out. One or two of them may not be, but they are all as extensive chants as that. None of them are the simple chants that we know as the Ambrosian Gloria, for instance. Uh, they're they're the more elaborate chants. It should be realized that in addition to that, well, first of all, the Curies do not have any of the tropes. It's only the Gloria. And the Sanctus, there is a Marian trope for the Sanctus as well as the Gloria. Well, and and that has a, a sort of particular corollary in the polyphonic tradition, which we haven't really touched on. But the fact that most, um, for example, Sarum Rite masses didn't have a Kyrie, they only had a Gloria. That's right. Yes. 
And and so is that related to that that emphasis on the Gloria in the Serum Rite? No. It has to do with the fact that traditionally the Kyries were troped. And the tropes varied from day to day. And so there was not it was not feasible to compose a polyphonic ordinary whose tro- whose text would only be usable one day of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the reason for no carriers in uh, in English masses because they were troped. So it's odd that that the um, the Serum Lady Mass does not use any tropes in the carriers. On the other hand, it's very extensive concerning alleluias and sequences. So the uh, the sequence is in fact called a sequence because it follows upon the alleluia. So it sequences upon the alleluia. And very often, the text of the sequence begins by restating the the sense of the alleluia, giving praise to God. And yet, for this Serum Lady Mass, there is a different alleluia and sequence for every day of the week. So seven, well, as far as the sequences go, there are 14 sequences all told in the the repertory for the, uh, the Serum Lady Mass. And what's interesting is, if you look at the tradition of the Roman Mass, the sequences occur in those days in which you sing an Alleluia, because it follows upon the Alleluia. When it comes down to Lent, for instance, instead of an Alleluia, there's a tract, and there's no sequence. The Serum Lady Mass, however, follows the gradual with a sequence in Lent. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's... (laughs) You know, it's it's just a much more elaborately developed system of worship. And it's astonishing to think that this elaborate Lady Mass tradition is still subordinate to the chapter mass, the mass of the of the canons of the cathedral. Yeah, it's and it must have been loved by the lay people too. I mean, just to think about, you know, what you've outlined in terms of the devotion of, um, or the, the commitment of personnel <laughs> and musical forces. And I'm wondering if we could just wrap up this topic by, if you might offer a few words about the connection between this strong devotion of resources to this practice of the Lady Mass and the subsequent flowering it had in uh, polyphonic music, especially in England. Yes, well, <clears throat> interestingly, the um, uh, how how polyphonic music developed was that it came out of the motet. The motet was to take a chant and set it in long notes and to write other fancier parts above it. And at some point, this whole technique was transferred to the mass ordinary. And very often, the chant that was used was not the text of the Mass Ordinary, but rather the text of another chant. And that other chant was very often a Marian chant, a Salve Regina or Ave Regina Celorum, for instance, or a Tota Pulcra S, or any number of other Marian chants that then came to be the foundation for the composition of fairly elaborate uh, a polyphonic masses. The interesting thing about the polyphonic mass is that there were very often uh, masses that were clearly identified as Marian masses, so that you had in England and also on the continent, you had the tropes of the Gloria still persisting in the 16th century. And the Council of Trent had to or decided to, <laughs> it's hard to know why, <laughs> why they had to, but <laughs> they decided that they should, they should ban those, those tropes. And you find manuscripts, for instance, of the masses of Morales, where, where you see the place where the, um, where the trope was, and in fact, it's been erased, and a repeat of the text that came before it is simply sung to the music that was Composed for the trope, so there was a there was a um, a fairly extensive replacement of those those tropes. It was also it's it's interesting to realize that 
between the North and the South, there was a great disagreement about the role of sequences. And the Romans didn't want to include sequences in the new Tridentine Missal. And the Germans had this wonderful repertory of sequences. It's very extensive. You look at a manuscript uh, gradual, for instance, of, uh, sort of early 16th century Germany, and half the manuscript is the mass propers, and the other half is all the sequences. So it's a lot of music and a lot of texts. And, and the Romans didn't like that. They wanted to get rid of them. And so the end result was, as you know, just a few sequences remained. Mm-hmm. Easter, Pentecost, Corpus Christi. The, uh, the, the sequence for, um, for the, uh, the Seven Sorrows of the Blessed Virgin didn't come in until another century. So that wasn't part of the, the, the sequences. And then the Dies Irae was also then still. Well, thank you, Bill, for illuminating our hearts and minds to this profound love of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the theological developments and the musical developments surrounding that liturgical act of, of worship of the Trinity accompanied by Our Lady. And this is a, a very beautiful tradition, I think, that can really um, help us understand not only the church's treasury of sacred music, but also the very popular, you know, practice today of 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 the Rorati Mass and similar sorts of devotions. Well, and you see that also what we have are plenty of Marian motets that we can still include in a solemn Mass. Right. Yeah. I think some of the, you know, the most loved chestnuts are... <laughs> Those those Marian uh, texts and they are and yes things. definitely. Thank you so much, Bill. Okay, my pleasure. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast with Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, Sacred Music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory.